It is my great pleasure to introduce my partner in government, our great governor, Ned Lamont. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Senator Fasano, Representative Claritas, or should I say Claritas Butler? <laughs> Not yet. This is one public-private partnership we all strongly approve. <laughs> My fellow state officials, members of the General Assembly, Judicial Branch, Lieutenant Governor Bisowitz, Annie, Emily, Lindsay, honored guests, and the people of the great state of Connecticut. Thank you again for trusting me for this office and inviting me back into the hall, the room where it happens. And thanks to our partnership, the state of our state is strong and it's getting stronger. But we're just getting started. We still have a long way to go. A year ago, I promised that we would work together to ensure that Connecticut's future would no longer be defined by a fiscal crisis. We made a down payment on that promise by passing an on-time, honestly balanced budget that showed we could live within our means and hold the line on taxes. We also boosted our state's rainy day fund to a record level that will protect key services, protect our most vulnerable residents, and protect our taxpayers through the next economic storm. In our efforts have made a difference for people. Our budget provided predictability to those counting on it most. I heard from school principals. I heard from superintendents, city and town leaders, small businesses and families, all saying, thank you, I know what I can expect and we can plan accordingly. Look, three years ago, just three years ago, the credit rating agencies downgraded our state. And you may remember that headline in the Wall Street Journal, quote, what's the matter with Connecticut? Well, today, the Wall Street Journal has a very different headline. Their tone in their last editorial was, quote, the state has dug a deep hole, and maybe now it has stopped digging. Hey, it's the journal. It's not perfect, but we're making progress, aren't we? Look, the rating agencies and the investors, they've upgraded our outlook for Connecticut for the first time in 18 years, from neutral to positive. <laughs> and as Treasurer Wooden would tell you, that is saving us tens of millions of dollars in interest costs. And by the way, economic growth picked up big time in our state last year, big time. And that means businesses and young families are now giving Connecticut a second look. They're talking about Connecticut, and we are responding. For a while in Connecticut, it wasn't just Democrats and Republicans who weren't talking. It was the state government that wasn't connecting. It wasn't connecting with our business leaders, wasn't connecting with labor leaders, wasn't connecting with educators. Lord knows we weren't talking to the hospitals. We had a failure to communicate. So first of all, I thought we needed to reset our relationship with the business community. So in the last year, I have personally visited about 100 different companies, from our state's largest employer, like Electric Boat, which now has over 12,000 employees working, the most in 30 years, the most in 30 years. And they've committed to hiring over 18,000 over the next 10 years, 18,000. I've also visited a lot of smaller startups, ones I love to visit, like the Little House Brewery in Chester. They're one of 100 craft breweries that have gotten going in this state. And uh, yeah, you ought to come on some of those visits with me. Look, I come out of the business world, and I gotta tell you, I love moving from the boardroom to the shop floor to the brew pub. 
I love getting to know these businesses. I get to know their employees, what they proudly build every day, and what it takes to keep them here in Connecticut, so they call Connecticut home. Look, our commissioners are also reaching out every day to ask, what can we do to help? And I'm so proud of our cabinet. It is... It's not only the most diverse in our state's history when it comes to gender and race, but talk about public-private partnerships, it also combines the expertise from leaders in the public and the private sector. They come from Hartford, they come from Waterbury, they come from Washington, D.C., they come from Washington State. My motto has always been hire great people and give them the freedom to make it happen, and that's what we're doing. David Lehman and the Department of Economic Community Development, they brought together more than 400 investors a few months ago, developers representing tens of billions of dollars, municipal leaders to launch ctopportunityzones.com, ctopportunityzones.com. Thousands of people, thousands of investors have taken a look at areas of the state that have been left behind too long, ready to invest in our state again. Where's Katie Dykes? Katie Dykes, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. There you are. <laughs> Thank you. You are making it easier to take a brownfield site and transform it into a new business. And 95% of those complex decisions are now taking place in less than 90 days. Less than 90 days. And all the while maintaining the very highest environmental standards. And there's Vanessa Durantes, our Commissioner of Department of Children and Families. Vanessa, where's Vanessa? She rose to the ranks, started out in Waterbury, has dedicated her entire career to our state's children. And thank you. We're, you're working at DCF, you're going to get us out from under that 1F legal decree. I'm trying to end this litigation one at a time. Thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> How about Josh Jabal, Department of Administrative Services? He's still going to roll out a one-stop process for all of our businesses that otherwise would have had to individually visit the Secretary of State's site, DRS, DOL, DECD, that alphabet soup of different uh, departments we got. Now you visit one site, you get registered, and you are ready to go. I promised last year that we'd be spending more time online, not in line, and we are just getting started. Josh is also helping to plan for that tsunami of state employee retirements over the next few years, which he sees as an opportunity to show the government can do more with less. And we're already centralizing computer services and personnel to provide better service across state government at 20% less cost than just a couple years ago. And talk about changing perceptions. Bloomberg News just recognized Connecticut is the fourth most innovative economy in the country. I don't, I don't applaud for fourth best. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's go. Here in Hartford, I saw Luke Bronin over there. The capital region is home to companies that are constantly innovate like Infosys, Ravi Kumar is here. That's a global digital company that has already hired about 600 Connecticut employees. And how about 600 right here in the last couple of years, right here in Hartford. How about Galaxy Solutions, a pioneer in IT analytics? It just announced it is bringing hundreds of jobs to Hartford and helping jumpstart Cigna's next-gen personalized medicine. Tim Bryan, are you here? Tim Bryan? Thank you for calling Connecticut home. Thank you for calling Hartford home. And thanks for your conviction that this is a great place to do business. And now it's just a short train ride away to Haven. 
Yale New Haven Hospital is breaking ground on a state-of-the-art neuroscience center that's going to transform medicine. Commercial developers are connecting the downtown with new buildings that will offer a model, modern lab and incubator space at a fraction of the cost of Boston and New York. And that means our STEM students and our PhDs and our emerging companies can achieve their dreams right here. New Haven is exploding with opportunity. Building permits there have more than doubled in the last year. And 2020 will be the biggest year yet. Where's Justin Elliker? And right down the street, over at Guilford, serial entrepreneur Jonathan Rothberg has created Butterfly IQ. It has all the preliminary FDA approvals right now to make sure that your smartphone can turn into a professional grade ultrasound imaging device, making healthcare affordable to people across the state and around the world. And Jonathan, I know you grew up in Connecticut. Thanks for staying in Connecticut. Thanks for growing in Connecticut. Thank you for what you're doing. Mayor Martin, remember those headlines from Stanford a few years ago? Oh, woe is us, UBS, the world's largest finance trading floor, is now sitting vacant. No longer. World Wrestling Entertainment has taken over that trading floor and will turn it into the world's largest digital production studio in the world. I think you're just getting started. I'm told there's about $6 billion of other development going on in uh, Stanford right now. Let's go. All right, Connecticut. We got our mojo back. But that only matters if we have an economy that works for everybody, starting with a vibrant and growing middle class. So neither Connecticut nor the middle class can grow, number one, unless we're preparing everybody of the next generation to get the job done. And the revamped Governor's Council has assembled one of the most talented, ambitious state workforce boards in the country, led by my friend Garrett Moran. It includes our state biggest employers and small. It includes educators, nonprofits, state agencies, and our unions to make sure that Connecticut maintains the best training pipeline in the nation. Look, I've said it many times, Connecticut has always had the best trained, most productive, best educated workforce in the world. And it's getting more competitive out there, so we've got to fight to keep up. <laughs> we have the best workforce in the world. You know why? Because we have the best teachers in the world. And our budget has made the largest investment in K through 12 education in the history of our state. And by the way, that takes some of the burden off of property tax, but it also it provides teachers the resources they need to teach everything. Everything from laser welding to computer coding. Look, to ensure that all our kids get their opportunity at the starting line of life, We've worked with local philanthropists to establish the Partnership for Connecticut and focus on disengaged and disconnected kids and young adults, doing everything we can to keep them back on track. We can't afford to lose anybody, and we love you, and we're going to fight to make sure that you get that opportunity. And look, I come out of the entrepreneurial world where you can often raise money to turn a good idea into a business. Well, the partnership will provide funding for teachers and not-for-profits to turn their best ideas into more hope for their students. And we've already had hundreds of responses to our first request for information, and we're just getting started on behalf of those kids. I guess somewhere out there is Commissioner Miguel Cardona, Commissioner of Education. There you are. Look, Miguel, you and I have prioritized, you know, 
half the kids in our state are children of color, maybe 10% of the teachers are teachers of color. And we made a big priority of recruiting more black and Hispanic teachers. More black and Hispanic teachers. Working with our historically black colleges, working with historically Hispanic colleges, making it easier for them to come and teach here. I want those kids to look up and say they can do it too. And it doesn't stop in high school. More and more jobs require post-secondary training. And we're doing more to make our higher education more affordable. So no student gives up his or her dream because they can't afford the cost. So starting this year, UConn will eliminate tuition for all students of families earning less than $50,000 a year. And community college will be debt free for all recent high school graduates. Turco agrees with that. Hughes agrees with that. Where's Will Haskell? By the way, more and more of our Connecticut employers are beginning to pay down student loans if you take a job with them. So Connecticut graduates, stay in Connecticut. We're making it worth your while. Look, reducing the cost of education is just one way we're trying to make Connecticut a little more affordable for our middle class families. We made it easier for seniors to stay in the state, thanks to you, by reducing taxes on Social Security and pension income. And we've provided veterans and volunteer first responders with more property tax relief, thanks to you. And to help small business, we've removed the business entity tax. And we've held the line on fees to make it easier for a plumber, an electrician, any of the trades. We so desperately need you to be able to stay here in Connecticut and expand here in Connecticut. We're doing everything we can to make it easier for you as well. And I'll say it again. Connecticut, we adopted America's best $15 minimum wage law. The nation's best. It's already helped lift thousands of families out of poverty. Right now, as of October 1, a number of families got a $35 a week raise. That's what it meant, a $35 a week raise. It lets them pay off a utility bill. Or some said, it just gives me a little more time to spend with my kids, maybe work one shift less. In the next five years, that law will help lift more than half a million Connecticut workers out of poverty. Primarily women, and people of color. So they receive their fair share of a growing economy. Do you know that for the first time in American history, I think, we have more women than men in the US workforce, more women than men working. Get to work, guys. So we have to do more to make sure our workforce works for them. And that starts in the executive ranks. I gotta say, where's Lieutenant Governor Beisowitz? She has worked with dozens of our major employers who have pledged that half of their senior leaders and corporate board members will be women in less than 10 years, half. <laughs> We're already doing it for the state of Connecticut, now they can do it too. And you'll be better for it. And that's why together we also adopted a bold new paid family and medical leave program. Bold new. That means no one in Connecticut will have to choose between 
a job they love, and a sick child. It makes it easier for people to work, makes it easier for young families to work, keeps our state going, and it's the right thing to do. And we've also, in terms of making it easy for people to work, we maintained and expanded access for affordable daycare with Care for Kids so that more middle-income families can afford quality child care. That means money back in the pockets of hardworking families. They're the Rodriguez's. Jennifer, Richard, you know, you just told me the story about how you would take in that small raise, if you did a little more overtime, you would have lost all the benefits of care for kids, and you would have lost money doing it. And instead, we've made it easier for middle class families to afford it, so that your beautiful daughter, you'll know, will have a great place, a safe place, while you're hard at work. Thank you, I hope it makes a difference. $50 increase per year would have made a big difference in terms of what you had to do. That would have cost you thousands in affordable daycare. All right. We've done a lot, and we've got a lot more to do. Having the best workforce and the best workplaces doesn't matter unless you can actually get to work. <laughs> Too many people are wasting time on their commutes. Not getting to work late, leaving home too early, not seeing their families. And I know it's the elephant in the room, <laughs> but we also know, and I think we all know this, that if we don't speed up, our economy is going to continue to slow down. And I think Republicans and Democrats alike agree the scope of the job, what we've got to do. There's general agreement on how much we've got to spend to invest in order to get the job done. I also know that um, it's a subject of some discussion, how we pay for it. All right, I'll cut to the chase. The Democrats have a plan. Includes a user fee on the big tractor trailer trucks that do most of the damage on our bridges. Uh, the Republicans have a plan that would um, redirect or divert money from the rainy day fund. Um, you got two plans on the table. And you're in the room where it happens. And that means make it happen by casting a vote, making up your mind, and getting this going. And um, we can do it right now. Can I have a show of hands? Don't worry, Marty. Uh, I'll, we'll get this done soon enough. I want to say also, in terms of jobs, that one of the real proposals we've got in this upcoming session is to redesign the state's economic incentive program, to focus on new good-paying jobs in growing sectors with a special emphasis upon those communities which have been getting left behind. And this is a change, because some of the best investments we can make as a state are in companies that are already here Rather than rely on those risky upfront grants to lure out-of-state companies, we're going, to endure, um, we're going to provide performance and based incentives, rewarding companies as they add on jobs right here. It's going to save us um, hundreds of millions of dollars in bonding and a lot less risk to our taxpayers. It gives folks incentives to grow and expand right here in the state of Connecticut. All right, it's great if you can, you got that job, but you also have to be able to find a home that you can afford. So my administration is going to support those communities that choose to welcome transit-oriented development that provides families with access to good homes near good jobs and good schools to make sure that our teachers and our firemen and our cops and child care providers can afford to live in the communities they serve. Families 
also need to be able to better afford health care. Look, Connecticut has some of the very best doctors and hospitals and payers in the world. So no excuse. We got to take the lead on increasing access to world-class affordable health care by shining a light on cost and quality. I'm proposing legislation that will curb annual cost increases so doctors' visits and prescription drugs stop consuming more and more of your paycheck every year. And Look, uh, Charlie Baker over in Massachusetts said similar programs there have already saved his state billions of dollars. I want to say something else. Right now, the White House is cutting funding for programs like Planned Parenthood that keep the full range of reproductive options available and affordable. Our budget's going to start making up that difference this year. viruses threatening our nation and state from overseas, now more than ever is the time for a thoughtful vaccination program which is so vital to keeping our families safe. <laughs> One last thing on pharma. We can also, we got a bill out there to do this, hold down prescription drug prices by seeking a federal waiver to join other states so we can purchase pharma from Canada at much less cost. Much less cost to you, much less cost to the state, much less cost to your constituents. It's the right thing to do. Thank you, sir. I'd also like to give a, a shout out to somebody who's going to be saving healthcare in innovative ways by getting better care for our state employees at less cost. And that's controller Kevin Lembo. Thank you for what you're doing there. You've been fighting for this for many years, Kevin. All right. Without leadership from Washington on some of these issues, it's up to us, and I love to work with my neighboring states to solve problems. Here in New England, we know that economic growth goes hand in hand with protecting our environment against pollution and climate change. The White House may not believe in climate change, but you know who does? The Navy. I was uh, recently there with the Admiral who oversees our nation's submarine fleet. And he told me that one of the big selling points for our new submarine base in Groton is our higher elevation. New construction moving up the hill, and they're moving their utilities from the basement to the top floor. I know, it seemed a little ironic to me, but if submariners are worried about rising tides, so should we. <laughs> State on the environment. Look, early in my administration, the Millstone Power Plant contract, contacted us and said they were thinking of closing, a plant that provides about half of our power and almost all of our zero carbon power. Look, we negotiated in good faith a deal that keeps them open for about 10 more years, providing clean energy and providing about 1,500 good paying jobs in southeast Connecticut for that period of time. And along the way, we're planning for the future. And Connecticut made the largest purchase of wind power in our state's history. You know what? I did it working with Gina and Charlie in our neighboring states, and we got the lowest published rates in the country by working together.
And you ought to see what that's going to mean in terms of our ports, like New London and, and Bridgeport. We're jump-starting those cities with the creation of thousands of new green jobs. And Connecticut will continue to take the lead in New England and beyond as we set a firm timeline for a carbon-free, energy-efficient future. There's a lot of talk about diversions. Let me say, no more diverting from our energy efficiency programs, no more diverting from Green Bank. We are delivering on our promises. Yeah. Now we got all the goodwill going, let me change it. We're also working with our states our neighboring states as we consider regulating marijuana for adult use. All right, like it or not, legalized marijuana is just a short drive away in Massachusetts, and New York is soon to follow. And I believe that a coordinated regional regulation is our best chance to protect public health by displacing illicit sellers and replacing them with trusted providers. And it's an opportunity to right the wrongs of a war on drugs that disproportionately impacted our minority communities. Right now, do you realize that what you can buy legally in Massachusetts, right across the border, can land you in prison here in Connecticut for up to a year. Look, we just marked the 100th anniversary of Prohibition. How did that work out? <laughs> that patchwork of cannabis and vaping laws, they're impossible to enforce. Look, during the last session we worked together, we raised the illegal age for tobacco and vaping products to 21 years of age. And we're going to work with our neighboring states. And we will work with our neighboring states to make our laws safe, uniform, and enforceable. Look, in a similar way, I want to work with you to ensure that together we stand up a responsible sports betting platform a planning betting platform that promotes economic growth for our state and is fair to our tribal partners. <laughs> eh, mixed response. Together, let's work to ensure that we're not left behind by our neighboring states. And we continue to move forward on gaming and do it in a way that avoids endless litigation. Uh, all right, before I close, I just want to tackle one more thing head on. No more bad mouth in the state of Connecticut. This is an amazing state. This is an amazing state. Everybody knows it's an amazing state. The rest of our country is looking at Connecticut in a new light. So should you. Optimism is contagious. Optimism is contagious. Make a difference. Look, I don't have rose-colored glasses on. I know we have a way to go, but we're making significant progress on your behalf every day. And let me just highlight a few small things. Aren't you sick and tired of waiting in endless lines over to Barbara to motor vehicles? <laughs> I heard that wherever I went. So have you. Well, so was our new commissioner, Bangi Magabani. Where's Bangi? There she is. Bangi used operations research to cut those wait times in half. And by the way, Bangi is one of the many immigrants whose success is Connecticut's success.
Bangi moved here from South Africa, fleeing apartheid, speaking only Zulu, graduated from Yukon, rose to the top tech position at Aetna, and is now making DMV work for you. How about next up, uh, license renewal from our iPhone. You ready? <laughs> All right, here's my last mention of transportation, I promise, at least today. Have you heard about the smart technology stoplights? They're amazing. We're going to be installing them as part of CT2030. We've all been heading home. It's late at night. There's not as car, a car as far as the eye can see. You're creeping up a little closer, looking around the corner, right? Well, these smart, smart stoplights are going to see that. They're going to see there's no cars coming in either direction, and that red light will automatically go to green. And it will stay green a little bit longer. Come on. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's going to make your commutes a little bit shorter, speeding up our highways, our exit ramps, speeding up bus service. It makes a difference. Talking about speeding things up, remember a little over a year ago when voters spent three or more hours in line, in the rain, in New Haven, waiting to cast their ballot? Well, this year, Secretary, yeah, you remember. <laughs> This year, Secretary of State Denise Merrill is making a difference on that. She's put in place a bill to streamline automatic and same-day voter registration. Automatic same-day voter registration. Now does that reduce those long wait lines on Election Day? It also We've got to build faith in our government, faith in the integrity of voting. And that's been jeopardized. Boy, was it jeopardized well, two nights ago in Iowa. Well, we're not going to let that happen in, here in Connecticut, I promise you that. Maybe the Connecticut caucus is something we ought to think about in four years. We can get it right. We can get it right. So anyway, I think that over the years, our government has had a bad case of the slows, and we are speeding things up. And we're also fixing some of those larger problems that have been festering for years. Speaking of never-ending litigation, we had that old lawsuit with the hospitals going back many years. That wasn't good for either party. And I got to say, working with you on both sides of the aisle, working with the hospital association, they were a great partner in reaching a reasonable compromise that saves the taxpayers from paying hundreds of millions of dollars a year it raises Medicare rates so community hospitals can continue to serve those most in need, all the while increasing eligibility for Medicaid in our budget to make sure more families have access to health care. More families have access to health care. And by the way, we're working. We already have the lowest rate of uninsured in the history of the state, and we can do better. That was a big difference, working with all of you. Special thanks to Melissa McCaw, Bob Clark, our general counsel. You put in hundreds of hours to get that done, and it was worth it. Last thing, look, results matter. We've shown that we can make government work for the people, and I'm proud of what we were able to achieve together. But what I love about Connecticut is not just what we've achieved, but also what we value. And we all celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday a few weeks ago. On a personal basis, I was particularly moved reading his letters home from Simsbury, Connecticut, where he was working on that tobacco farm as a very young man. I think he was 15. And he wrote home to his daddy that he loved Connecticut because he felt so welcome here at the restaurants, at the plays, in the church. And he saw a contrast with what he was used to back home in Georgia. He felt that especially as he traveled in a train car where blacks and whites sat together from Hartford down to Washington, D.C. And then in Washington, D.C., he had to step into a segregated car on the way down to Atlanta. And he wrote that experience in Connecticut was key to inspiring him 
to take up the ministry in the cause of racial and economic justice. I'm not saying for a second that we're that good, but I'm saying that every day we try to be that good. And you look at the dysfunction in our nation's capital. We were shocked by that hate speech and the parade in Charlottesville some couple years ago. And I don't want to see any of that poison leaking closer to our home here in Connecticut. I met with rabbis who fear tax on their synagogues in the Jewish community, wondering what happened to the country they loved and felt so safe in. I just remind people, an attack on your synagogue, an attack on your mosque is an attack on my church. We're family. We stand up against attacks like that. That's what Connecticut's about, and that's not what America's about. As I travel, I talk to a lot of communities that are asking for more police protection. I met with many of the African American ministers who speak about fear in their communities, fear of gun violence. Some of them actually are wondering about, about the police and hope that they're there to protect them. So I got to tell you, I as a governor, you as a legislator, law enforcement, we, every day we work to rebuild that trust in all of our communities across this state. Give them confidence that we're there for them. And during those trying months when our TVs were filled with pictures of the immigrant kids crossing the border, separated from their families at the Rio Grande, and I met with Hispanic families, I met with Hispanic kids here in Connecticut, and they were afraid to go to school. They were a little worried about going to soccer practice. And Connecticut knows immigrants and refugees and rich our community and make our state better, and we're going to remind them every day, thank you for being here in Connecticut. Because these are Connecticut values. These are Connecticut values. We're a family. We're all in it together. I've been governor for now a little over a year. Look, and I celebrate so much good in our state, a state that can serve as a shining example for Martin Luther King and for communities across the country. And we're proud that you call Connecticut home, and every day we'll work to earn your faith in our great state. And we're just getting started. We're much better when we work together. God bless you, and God bless the great state of Connecticut. Thank you.